am, like I said, Sarah Arawesti. I am normally a singer when I am not in, in the kitchen, but one of my favorite things to do is share my Sephardic culture with young and old. And um, I'm just thrilled to be able to share some of my Rosh Hashanah traditions with you, which are really unique if you've never celebrated a specifically Sephardic Rosh Hashanah. We're gonna be talking about the Seder that we have in the Sephardic tradition. But first I need to give you a little bit of background to create some setting for what we're going to make tonight. And you can learn a little bit about where these recipes come from. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Now I am so inspired to talk to you tonight because of this gentleman that you see on the right. The little boy looks like he's wearing a sombrero. That is my grandfather. This picture was taken around 1910 in our family's hometown of Monastir, which today is in North Macedonia and is called Bitola. But this picture, um, as you can see, he was with his cousin Max. They were getting all spiffed up for the Pasha, like the governor who was coming to town. And I share this picture with you because all of the traditions that I have in my family were passed down from my grandfather, who was the patriarch, who was the oldest of nine brothers and sisters. And uh, the traditions I'm sharing with you come from back in the old country, from Monastir. Now, if you're not familiar with Sephardic history, very briefly, this is not the time <laughs> to give you a whole lesson on Sephardic culture, but just so you know, those of us, Jews from Spain who were kicked out in 1492, most of us, not all, but most of us went towards the East, towards the Middle East, towards the Ottoman Empire. And on this map you see here, um, I circled in purple, if you can see, that is roughly where Monastir is today. Upper Greece, lower Yugoslavia at the time, and today, like I said, it's in North Macedonia. And it's very close to its sister city, which you can see in the yellow box of Salonika. Salonika is the city that most people have heard of in the Balkans that was, um, majority Sephardic, but in fact, Monastir was like its sister city and had a very prominent and large Sephardic community as well. Now, when my family came to the United States, they came in 1912 and 1913 during the Balkan Wars. These are wars we don't really talk about so much anymore, but nonetheless, there was a very large Sephardic migration to the United States then. And my family ended up in Rochester, New York. And here again with the red arrow, you see my grandfather and he is standing at a table where they are celebrating the rabbi from Monastir who made his way all the way to the United States in the mid 1920s to raise money for the cemetery in Monastir, which is still today the largest Jewish cemetery in the Balkans. We're going to hear more about that cemetery a little bit later in the program. But the reason why I show you this picture is that for any reason, for any occasion, whether it be a visitor or a holiday, we Sephardic families always gathered around a big table, enjoyed lots of food and merriment. And so I want to bring some of that joy and merriment to you tonight. Now, we are going to talk about the Rosh Hashanah Seder, which some of you might not have celebrated before. Uh, raise your hand if you've had a Rosh Hashanah Seder before. Okay, a couple of you, which is great. So this is the Ladino spelling, Rosh Hashanah, and Ladino is the language of Sephardic Jews who traveled eastwards, and it is also known as Judeo-Spanish. And we are going to talk about the symbols, the simanim. There are eight symbols. So some of you might be more familiar with a Seder for Passover, but we actually have our own Seder in the Sephardic tradition and it has extended to many Jewish groups at this point. But uh, the symbols are mostly the same, but they are in a different order depending on where your family settled. 
So that is why it is called a Seder because it does follow a specific order. And we are going to go through these eight simanim right now. For each food that we eat, we are going to say a Yehirat Son, which is a blessing, a wish to God for how we want our new year to proceed. And it comes from the first few words of each blessing in the Hebrew, Yehirat Son, Melfanecha Adonai Loheinu Velohe Avotinu, in Ladino, Sea Veronta Delantre de Ti Adonai Nuestro Dio y Dio de Nuestros Padres. May it be thy will, Lord our God and God of our ancestors. And then you say your wish. So here you see the eight simanim, the eight items that we say Yehiratsonis over. And we start with our apples. Now this ceremony always happens after Kiddush. And for some people, Hamotzi. Then we say our eight Yehiratsonis. And then we have a beautiful large meal. We always start with the apple dipped in honey or sugar, mansana. And then we have spinach, could also be beet leaves, spinaka. Now spinaka is going to be very important because we are making a very special dish with spinaka very soon. Dates, oh, sorry, I skipped leeks. Prasa, prasa. Dates, datles or datiles. Squash can be also pumpkin or zucchini. Calabaza, calabaza. Black eyed peas. Pijones, these are my favorite. I love these. Pomegranate, mangrana. And the head of a fish or cheek meat, but I am a vegetarian, so I'm going to use a head of a lettuce, uh, but nonetheless, we're going to call it pescado, pescado. And each of these has a different prayer and different meaning, and we don't have time to go through all eight. That would be a different session. We're really today going to concentrate on the spinach and the calabaza, the pumpkin. But where do these symbols even come from? Believe it or not, it actually comes from the Talmud in Horayot 12a, as you can see. In the bottom, it says, Abaye said, now that you said that an omen is a significant matter, a person should always be accustomed to seeing these on Rosh Hashanah, squash and fenugreek, leeks and chard and dates. Wow. <laughs> these have been around for a long time. And in the last thousand or plus years, some of these foods have adapted and increased and different communities uh, make their own yehiratsonas and have changed some of the foods around. But there is some real history here for where this Rosh Hashanah Seder comes from. And I'm thrilled to be cooking some of these dishes with you. So let's get to it. Let us cook. We're gonna start with the rodanche. So I'm gonna unshare my screen. Okay, are there any questions so far? Okay. Now with the rodanches, I, some people have asked me, where does the name come from? And the rodanches are called roses because they look like roses and they're in the shape of a rose and they come from the ancient Greek word for rose which is Rhodan. That's where the Isle of Rhodes comes from and Sephardic Turkish pastries make uh, a similar pastry in a similar shape. Um, some people call it a bulema, bulemas, um, often filled with spinach and cheese. But the pumpkin filling, the calabaza, is traditionally served for Rosh Hashanah and even Sukkot, and that's what we'll be making today. Um, a note before we start cooking, these can be made either more savory or more sweet. So you can add some 
cheese, like feta cheese, um, increase a little bit of the salt and make it a little bit more savory. I choose to go a little bit on the sweeter side. So we're gonna stick to the sweet. And uh, here we go, let's get started. I hope that you have your ingredients with you, your ingredient list that I sent ahead of time if you are cooking with me. And I'll be walking through the steps as we go along and you can always watch this replay later. So the first thing we're going to do is take our calabaza, our pumpkin. And I'm just using one can of pumpkin. And as I'm cooking, if you have questions, please direct them to my sous chef, Jeff. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was my first can of pumpkin. Next, we are going to put in a half cup of sugar. Now, if you're gonna go more savory, you might decrease this a little bit, but this is still on the lower end. Okay, that was a half cup of sugar. Now I'm going to use one teaspoon of cinnamon. And a pinch, a pinch of salt. Now I'm going to do two tablespoons of olive oil. And I'm just going to mix it around. That looks so good. It already smells so good. I mean, what's not to like about pumpkin? Tis the season. Okay, once you have it mixed, I'm gonna hold off on the walnuts and I'm gonna add them in later. They are optional, so you really don't need to add them if you're allergic or if you don't want. Okay, so the next step we're gonna do is we're gonna bring it over to the stove and we are going to um, cook it on low for just a few minutes just to get the, uh, some of the moisture out. So by the power of magic, pretend, that I've already done so. It's already been on the stove for a few minutes. And once it was done on the stove, I then put it in a lined colander. So you can see it's just a paper towel over a colander. And this has been sitting for about two hours. And look how much extra moisture. Can you see that? How much extra moisture there was. So that's why we recommend if you have the time to do so because you really want it to be as dry as possible. If you don't have time, that's fine. These are still gonna work and still be delicious. So if you're cooking along with me, you really didn't need to do this, this step. Okay, but since I already have gone ahead and done it, I'm going to dump the excess liquid. And then I'll get all the liquid out. I'm simply going to take this pumpkin and put it right in, splash, and put this aside. Now I am going to add some walnuts because I do think it gives a really delicious crunchy taste. So I'm gonna put in some walnuts. I don't necessarily have to use the whole, uh, the whole cup that's recommended. Good. I'm going to fold it in. You know, if you want to show me what yours looks like, if you're having any problems, go ahead and raise your hand or put a comment in the chat and just check. Um, so, how much pumpkin? One can. And a can is about 12 ounces. 14. Yep. And then, um, is this uh, really pumpkin puree or should it be solid pumpkin packed? Um, it should be solid pumpkin packed. Yes. Or squash, whatever's available in your supermarket. It's sort of the same. Um, Sarah, you have a wonderful sous chef, and I agree. <laughs> 
Thank you, Tatiana. <laughs> okay, so once I folded in the walnuts. Oh, wait. Oh. Um, Doris wanted to point out that, um, thank you, pumpkin puree already has the sugar, so. Yeah, so unsweetened. Yeah. Yeah, unsweetened. That's important, because then, yes, it would be cloying. Okay. All right, so now we are ready to make our roses. Is everybody ready? Are people cooking along with me and they're ready? Okay, you might need another minute, but I'm gonna go ahead and show you what I've done with the phyllo dough. Now, I am a proud Sephardic cook, but I do not claim to ever make my own phyllo dough. That is for my great aunts and uh, the real experts out there. So um, I have gone ahead and bought my phyllo dough and um, I'm, a, I'm a mom of two young kids under the age of six, so I am going to proudly use whatever hacks I can. Um, so if you are a purist and a traditionalist, I hope that you will forgive me for using store-bought phyllo dough. So when you get your pack, you, they normally come in big sheets. You want to cut them in thirds so that your rectangles are about six by 12. And we're going to be working with two at a time. So when you're not using a piece, you might just want to use a wet, um, a very lightly wet paper towel or dishcloth to cover the others so they don't dry out. But in the span of 30 minutes, they're not really going to dry out. Now this is the fun part. This is making, making the roses. So we are going to take one piece of phyllo dough at a time. I'm going to break them up. So this nice, beautiful sheet. Jeff, can you make sure that they can see? Uh, yeah. Okay. And here's my first square. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to brush it very lightly with some melted butter. Now you can also use olive oil or vegetable oil. I've used olive oil and butter. You know, it depends what you're making for your meal, if you need it to be kosher. Uh, I, and tonight, I'm going to be using butter. And I'm gonna just very lightly brush the first piece of phyllo dough. I saw a question come in. Yep. Uh, do you prefer a brand of phyllo dough? Oh, no, whatever is available at my local supermarket. But it is hard to find. It is hard to find. We had to go to at least two supermarkets to find it. So I just lightly brushed the first piece of phyllo dough and then I'm gonna put another one right on top of it. And I'm also going to brush that one. And somebody uh, did comment on my apron. Thank you very much. Ladino does rock. And if you do like that message, I have lots of swag. I have tote bags and even face masks and other fun things that also say Ladino rocks. So thank you for asking. Okay, now we have brushed our two layers of phyllo dough. And now we are going to take our pumpkin. Now I like to use a small spoon. You can even just use your hands. But I'm gonna scoop out a little bit at a time. And what we're gonna do is make a very thin layer on the closer border. So the, the closer edge. So you can see that I'm working with a spoon and my fingers and making just a thin line. Close to the edge, but not quite on the edge because we still need to fold over. I'm just making a nice straight line. And the fact that I let it drain for a few hours before, it really feels like a paste right now and is really easy to handle. If you don't do this, like I said, it's okay, but it might just feel a little bit looser. About how thick is your row? My row is probably about no more than three quarters of an inch or so. It's, it's pretty thin. Okay, can you all see that? Now, this is the delicate part. We are going to very, very carefully take the edges and roll, make one roll on top of the layer of pumpkin. I'm just gonna gently twist it over like that. And then we're gonna brush that part with some more butter and then we're going to roll it again. We're gonna get about three rolls in. See? 
And each time you're gonna just brush it really lightly. And then one more roll. And one more little layer, just like that. Okay, so now I have my roll. My pumpkin is sitting hidden, uh, hidden in the middle. And this is the spiral part. Now you have to really, this takes a little bit of practice because you don't want to coil it too tightly or it can break. But you also don't want it to be too loose because you want it to look like a coil, like a rose. So I am going to start at about, I'd say maybe six inches in. And I'm very lightly, you can see, I'm gonna just start turning it really lightly. I'm gonna coil it around and Philo is so sensitive and see look I already just broke a little piece but it's okay it's gonna bake right in see that is your rose it's as simple as that and then I have a tray ready with some parchment paper and I'm just gonna very carefully put it on top we're gonna practice making one more so again we're gonna take one piece of phyllo, gonna brush it lightly with our butter. Thank you for whoever told me to give you a better camera angle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then we're gonna put another one on top. Brush it. One second. Eric, Eric, is there, is a, there particular a particular number on the phyllo? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Is there a particular number on the phyllo? The thickness of the phyllo? Good question. I don't know. Our sous chef will check that out in just one minute. They are very thin. That I can tell you just from, from the feel. Yes, it's so thin. Okay, so now I have my row again. You all see that? And I'm going to start folding. Here I go. I made one fold. And I'm going to brush. Now I'm going to make another fold. And I'm gonna brush. And I'm gonna make one more fold. So you get about three, you get three folds in. Okay, now it's the spiral part. So again, I'm gonna go in about six inches or so, and I'm gonna just start very, very carefully twisting it around. Careful not to do it too tightly. So you don't want it to break. Oh, that's a good one. And there we go. Orodancha, a rose. How are you all doing over there? If you're cooking with me, give me a thumbs up, thumbs down. And we're checking on the phyllo number right now. doesn't seem to say. It doesn't seem to say. We're checking on it. Okay, so in the meantime, we have been uh, preheating the oven uh, to 350 degrees. And we don't have time to make a whole batch right now, but by all means, if you are at home right now and you are cooking, please uh, make as many as you want. You can actually store the roses, the rodanches, for up to about two days in your refrigerator. Um, and you can also store the pumpkin to make it later. If you do pre-make these and store them, I would just brush a little bit more butter on top and add a couple minutes on to um, the baking time if you let it sit for a couple of days. But these are some beautiful rodanches right here and I'm gonna put them in the oven. I put them in for 30 minutes. Uh, I do check on them maybe once in the middle, but 30 minutes seems to do, do the trick. Two questions. Yes. Would you like to put it in first? And then yes, I'll, okay, I'll, here I go. Okay. <laughs> All 
So um, Denise Roditi, and pardon me if I mispronounced your name, says that um, she uses Athens brand number three. Okay. And our brand that we use was um, the Philo factory, but it does not say um, it's uh, gauge, if so to speak. Um, Sarah Liza Moore asks, do you use two layers of Philo or three? Two. I use two. So I do one layer, I brush it, and then I use a second one right on top, and I brush that. And then uh, Adas Smith asks, what about using fresh pumpkin or squash? You Which squash would you recommend? Hmm, that is a great question. Um, I have to admit, I don't really use fresh squash, um, but the chef, Jeff would be happy to answer. I would recommend using a sugar pumpkin if you're going to go with pumpkin. It has a nice sweetness to it. Um, and then you could also use like a butternut or an acorn squash probably mm -hmm. for a nice uh, texture and sweetness to it. Yes, and I do see um, that Annette asked me, do I keep the phyllo covered with a damp cloth so it doesn't dry out? Yes, um, in case you missed that, um, we do do that. I had mentioned that um, I sometimes just take, as you can see here, a slightly damp uh, paper towel, or you can use a dish cloth, and you can lay it on the phyllo pieces that you're not using. Um, I work pretty quickly, so in the span of 30 minutes when I'm making these, I can make about 12 easily. Um, they tend to not dry out so quickly, so um, I don't really need to use it, but it's a great practice uh, to do. So continue making your roses. I am going to move on because we still have another dish to make and we have songs to sing. So I hope you guys got the memo that this was not just a cooking class, but it was also a singing one. It is a cook and sing because in the Sephardic tradition, it is rare to be in the kitchen without song. It is one of my favorite parts about my tradition and I have such recollections of my own family members um, cooking and singing and so I want to share that tradition with you. So in case you don't have the song sheets, I am going to splash them on the screen. I am going to put aside the pumpkin for a minute. Make room. Okay, so I want to start the singing portion as these cook with one of my favorite songs by one of my favorite artists, Lori Jagoda, who is credited, rightfully so, for really bringing, helping to bring Ladino to America. Um, she is I, I'd like to think she's a dear friend and a wonderful mentor and just um, uh, one of my greatest inspirations in Ladino music and culture. I love sharing her music every chance I get. So Flori wrote this song, Chico y Anico, because of the memory she had of cooking in the kitchen with her own grandmother. And then when she became a grandparent, cooking. Here, um, Ico is the diminutive form in Ladino for little, so um, little Ian, um, uh, Ian, Ian Ico, and she is recalling the memory of cooking in the kitchen with Ian Ico, but uh, what's, what she says about this song is that it wasn't just about cooking the food, it was the joy of the mess that was made because we can get kind of messy in Sephardic cooking with all the doughs and flours. And so little Ianico, he's loving making borretas with his grandmother, but there's also flour going everywhere. And I just love that image for the holidays, cooking with our families, no matter what mess is made. So I want to teach this song uh, with you. And I hope that uh, as you can see, I'm already making, <laughs> making my own mess as my sous chef is, is laughing at me. <laughs> um, okay, so 
Uh, here we go. I'm going to teach you the melody on la 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 la, and then I'm going to trust that you will pick up that melody and we'll be able to sing uh, the Ladino with me. So this is on la 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 la. La 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 Let's try that. La 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 Great. Second part. La 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 melody you guys have it i can feel you through the zoom screen singing <laughs> okay so we're going to do each verse twice and then we're going to do the la la la's twice and because i can't hear you i am going to trust that you are singing your hearts out okay here we go we're going to start with chico y nico Yehiratsonas together. Now again, the Yehiratsonas are the special blessings that we say for our simanim, for our Seder plate. And what you have in front of you, uh, we're going to do three. We're going to do apples, fish or lettuce head, <laughs> and datiles, the dates. And for apples, we are going to ask to be renewed with sweetness for the good year, the year ahead. For the pescado, we're going to ask that our merits may multiply like the fish in the sea. The fish head also represents that we are the heads and not the tails, so that we <clears throat> may be leaders and not followers. And the dates, <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. That our uh, that our enemies shall be weakened, like all those who seek our harm. And I like to put a positive spin on that, and and ask that we only see friendship and peace in the year to come. So the Yehiratzonis, these are traditional, and <clears throat> I am going to just to sing the the first one, so you can get the melody in your head. Sea voluntad el hambre de ti. Let's start with that. Sea voluntad el hambre de ti. Adonai nuestro Dios y Dios de nuestros padres. Try that. Adonai nuestro Dios y Dios de nuestros padres. Que sereno de sobre nosotros. Que sereno de sobre nosotros. Año 
bueno ir, yo sé. Año bueno ir, yo sé. If you try that, I'm going to sing the whole thing so you can hear how it sounds. Sea de luta del andro de ti, Adonai, nuestro Dios, y Dios de nuestros padres, que se renove sobre nosotros. Año bueno y dulce, que se renove sobre nosotros. Año bueno y dulce. You think you guys got that? I think so. Let's try it. We're going to go through all three. And the idea of the hiratsones is that we say this blessing, we eat the food, and by ingesting it, our wishes come true. Here we go. Say, in Ladino, feel free to message me later and I'm happy to send those out. We have uh, a few more songs to sing, but I am actually going to switch over to the spinach and save those two uh, songs for the end. So, I want to tell you why this spinach in my simanim for my seder are so important to me. Because of this woman here. Oh, oh, uh oh, sorry. There. My cousin Rochelle. This picture was taken in February with my cousin Rochelle two years old. She is going to be 103 in less than a month. And she is a survivor of so many things, including COVID two months ago. And at 102, she came out the other side and is just a miracle of nature for so many reasons. Um, this picture is, um, I hope you can see the joy in my kids and in everybody who, who meets her. And I want to tell you a little bit about her story because she was born in Monastir, the same city where my, uh, where my grandfather was born. And this is a picture of her in the 1930s walking down the street with her friends. And this is in the streets of Monastir. And I'm going to fast forward to tell you that Every single person in this picture perished in World War II, uh, except for my cousin, Rochelle. Uh, 
A lot of people know about the story of, of Monastir's neighbor, Salonika, which was obliterated during the Holocaust, but just the same, Monastir lost 98% of its Jewish population. There were only a handful of survivors, of which my cousin Rochelle is one. She survived by hiding in the trunk of a car and being shuttled over to Albania where she was given a new passport and lived out the war with a Muslim family with a new identity. She became Fatima Hussein during the war. And when she returned to Monastir, when it was after, um, everyone was gone, including her family who had perished. Um, I have made it my mission to preserve her stories and the stories of, of others from, from Monastir, and I do that in part through music and also by leading trips to Monastir to show them what a beautiful community it once was. And I want to share this picture. Um, in March, I was there, um, unfortunately, right when COVID broke out and I found myself stuck in Monastir. And um, as my sous chef husband, Jeff, can attest, uh, when he was trying furiously to get me home back on U.S. soil, I said, you know what, there's no other place I feel safer in the world. If I had to be anywhere in the world, I'd want to be in my homeland of Monastir. Um, so here I was on March 15th on the streets of Monastir, which is now called Bitsola, and this is the same exact street where the picture right above it was taken. So let's just let that sit for, for a minute to be able to walk that same blessed ground, that same street, that same cobblestone where so many people before me lived and sadly perished. But I have this light of Rochelle who keeps my spirit moving. And this is a picture, I think some of the people in this picture might actually be on this Zoom right now. Um, two summers ago, I brought a group of about 20 or so Americans to Monastir with me, to Macedonia, North Macedonia now. And uh, this picture is taken in front of the cemetery. And if you remember, we saw a picture earlier on in the presentation where the rabbi in the mid 1920s came to visit my family in Rochester, New York to raise money for this same cemetery. And so fast forward a hundred years and here we were uh, visiting the cemetery. I, I do see a question. There's a question that's timely. Um, are, what's the, what is the Jewish community like in Monastery right now? Great, great question. There is not one single Jew left in Vitula. There are Jews in nearby Skopje and in a few other cities in Macedonia, North Macedonia, like Shtip, and a few other places, but in Bitula Monastir, there are none, which is why I am so empowered to be doing uh, what I'm doing. Um, so I'm trying to raise, raise awareness of the Jewish community, and I'm doing that through music. And um, I have asked you um, in participating in this evening to think about um, donating to the Monastir Project, which is um, a project that I founded with the governments of Macedonia and Israel to bring citizens together through music and cultural dialogue to preserve some of the memories and history of this population. Oh, I get choked up. Um, so this project is incredibly meaningful to me, and I hope that you will, uh, in the spirit of Rosh Hashanah, think about donating generously to that. Because there are no Jews left there, it is imperative that we keep these stories alive. And uh, I wanted to show you one last picture about Rochelle. This is her house that is still standing in the main street of Bitula Monastir. And I put in yellow, you can see that there are still Magen David, Jewish stars in the grill of the balcony. And this house has become hugely famous in Macedonia as the Jewish house. It still remains with its Jewish stars in place and people come and they know that it is a Jewish house. My family has put a plaque there with, uh, with my cousin Rochelle's family portrait from the 1930s so that people know that a real Jewish family once lived there. 
And this was me actually sitting on that balcony a couple of years ago on a tour there. And this brings me to the spinach. Believe it or not, there is a tie-in. So here is my cousin Rochelle. This was about 15 years ago when she was the sprightly young age of 89 or so. And here she is with uh, my younger, uh, a cousin of mine, Zach, making the spinach fritters we are about to make. This is her specialty, her recipe. I've added only one tiny little thing, um, but I owe this spinach fritter to my cousin Rochelle from Monastir. So with that segue, let's get to it. Okay. So these are actually very easy to make. Keftes de spinaca. And some people make them with leeks, keftes de prasa, which are also very, very common for, uh, for Rosh Hashanah. But we are going to make them with the spinach. And I should say that the uh, the ingredients here, there are very few. This is not a complicated dish to make, um, so you might not learn technique from me, but they are very meaningful personally, and they are just simply delicious, and they are a Sephardic treat. Uh, so with that in mind, we are going to take two bags of frozen chopped spinach. You can use regular spinach and cook it yourself and chop it up. Like I said, I like using hacks. Um, I am only using half of the recipe right now, but the recipe you have in front of you is for a full recipe, just so you know. So I would use two bags of frozen chopped spinach, heated and then squeezed dry. It's really important you get as much moisture out as possible. Okay, then I'm gonna take a whole onion and I went ahead and grated it ahead of time, but I have just a big grater that I grate the onions and I try not to cry. Okay, then I'm going to use a half, use one cup rather of matzo meal. You can also use breadcrumbs. Um, if you're gluten-free, you can find some gluten-free matzo meal, um, but this is regular. Right in. I am going to use um, one and a half teaspoons of kosher salt and pepper to taste. We like pepper in this in this family. Um, sous chef Jeff is from New Mexico, so so we like our spice. The, the question was, uh, do you use the fine side or the coarse side of the box right here? Coarse, the coarse side. Great question. Now this is my one addition from Cousin Rochelle's recipe. I add paprika. So I love a taste of paprika. It might not be your taste, so this is optional, but I'm gonna add it in and you can even add more. I think right here is just, um, just a little bit, just a half a teaspoon, but I bet Chef Jeff would like me to add even more. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and then we are gonna do three large eggs beaten. And that's it. Then we're gonna mix it all together. Now you can mix this and then you can also store this for some time, but I'm gonna go ahead right now and, and make it. If you find that it's too wet, you can always add some more matzo meal. This to me looks like a really good consistency. Mm, it smells so good. Okay. There we have it. Y'all see that? That is exactly what it should look like. Okay. So now, if you remember my cousin Zach, he had a little bowl, well, sorry, a little ball of spinach in his hand. 
There's no science to this. You can use a melon scooper or an ice cream scooper if you want. I'm just gonna use my hands and I am just going to take pretty small balls. They are maybe like that, the size, you see that? In the palm of my hand, it fits pretty, pretty well right in the palm of my hand. And I'm just gonna start making some balls I'd say they're about maybe four inches wide. We didn't have that in the <laughs> <laughs> And you can make them more round or more flat. I make them round and then I sort of pat them down a little bit so they look like little patties. And while I do this, we have the oil going because you want the, the oil to be really hot on the stove. This should be a pretty uniform size. And you really wanna pack them because you don't want them to become loose in the oil, but these look like they're exactly the right consistency. I feel cousin Rochelle in the room with me, watching over as we make these. Okay, I'm gonna make one more and then we're gonna go over to start frying them. If you're making these at home, lift them up so I can see. Okay. I think, I think we've got six really good ones here. And this is what we'll start with. Okay, now, so that I can keep talking and singing with you, I'm gonna have Chef Jeff go over to the stove. And I'll show you a picture of them crackling. Okay, so I'm gonna take over the questions if anybody has. Any particular type of paprika? Oh, that is a great question. Well, I'm fortunate that whenever I go to, uh, to Monastir, I bring back paprika with me. <laughs> so I actually have some paprika straight from the homeland. Um, <laughs> but you don't need to use that. Um, Chef Jeff, what paprika would you recommend? Um, if you like smoked and spicy, you can do a Spanish paprika. Spanish paprika. But um, I, since Sarah started bringing back the Macedonian paprika, I'm a big fan of it. <laughs> More so than the Hungarian paprika. I hope to go back next spring and lead another uh, tour if COVID allows us. Oh my goodness. Um, and I will gladly take some orders <laughs> before I go. Um, it really does make a difference. Okay, so when you fry them, again, you want the heat to be really, the oil to be really, really hot. And it's about three, uh, about three minutes on, on each side until they're, they're golden brown. Gotta get the oil a little hotter, but it's it's almost there. Okay, we're almost there with the with the oil getting uh, getting hot. So while we wait, we're gonna sing a few more songs. The Rodanches are gonna be really simple. Oh, two more minutes for the Rodanches. So maybe we'll wait one more minute. And I'd love. I know some of you said where you're currently from. If you uh, have a story from your own heritage. If you're, if you um, identify as being Sephardic, I'd love to know where your families are from. And um, I do have a few questions. Um, how big are the bags of spinach? One pound or twelve ounces? They are twelve ounces. But we're double checking right now. Twelve ounces. Twelve ounces, indeed. Um, how can someone get to go on your tours? Great question. Um, I put out lots of, um, uh, of feelers and reminders and all over my, um, my own personal website and social media when I do plan the tours. Um, we were hoping to have one this March. It looks unlikely, but um, hopefully it will be the following March at this point. But if you are not already on my mailing list, if you stay on my mailing list, and I'll give you that information in a minute, you definitely will be notified when the next tour happens. 
And, um, oh, uh, I missed eggs. Did you add some eggs? Yes, to the spinach fritters, we added three eggs, three eggs. That's definitely important. That's what helps keep it, keep it together. And now let's check on those rodanchas. Wow. Look at these. They're too hot to eat, but I don't know if you can see how gorgeous they look. If you could only smell them, they are perfect brown topping. Oh, they look perfect. Yum. I hope if you've made that at home, that you are enjoying the smell right now as well. And as soon as they cool off a little bit, I'll take a taste on everyone's behalf. Great, I see wonderful locations where people are from. Um, how do we manage to not destroy or at least cut the phyllo as we roll it? It's a great question. The key there is really making sure that um, you put enough butter on them. Um, I spread it pretty lightly, but you can definitely um, feel and see the butter. If it's too dry, you're, you're right, it won't roll. So you definitely need to have enough butter or oil um, each time you roll it. And you just have to be so careful as you roll it. I do it very, very slowly and carefully as I coil it. And the big hint there is you just can't do it too tightly. The tighter you go, the more likely it will break. It also helps that it's room temperature. Room temperature as well. If it's too hot, it could melt a little bit, the phyllo. So we let this sit for a couple of hours, the pumpkin mixture before we put it in our phyllo. Okay. So now we are going to sing a few more songs. I'll continue to look to see if we have more questions, but I do want to get to these last, uh, last songs. And you're going to show us what they look like in a minute, Chef Jeff? Yeah. Okay. He's already taken a taste of one of them. It's good. <laughs> okay. Um, I should say that, uh, I, I don't think I said what the yihirazon for the squash is. So it's too hot for me to eat, but when I do eat it, uh, if it's after this session ends, I want you to at least hear the yihirazon, which is, may it be thy will, Lord our God and God of our ancestors, that you should tear up our evil decrees and let there be read before you our merits. And this is a really interesting Yehiratzon because the Hebrew word for gourd, kara, sounds like the Hebrew word kara, which means to tear or rend or also to proclaim. So uh, we really like our puns in Sephardic culture. And so uh, that is why the kalavasa, the squash, um, has its yihiratzon of tearing, rending evil decrees and proclaiming our merits. And my interpretation of that is modern contemporary interpretation is that eating this kalavasa, this rodancha, this squash, this, this pumpkin is a reminder for us to count our blessings. It has been a tough year all around for everybody. And even so, we must always remember to count our blessings. So that is what I will think about as I eat my calabaza, my rodanche. And the spinach, Yihiratzon. May it be thy will, Lord our God and God of our ancestors, that your enemies and all those who seek our harm shall be removed. And this is because the Hebrew word for beat which you can either have spinach or beet greens. The Hebrew word for beet, selek, sounds like the word yistalku, which means to beat a retreat. And my contemporary interpretation is that the spinach represents the freedom that we hope we feel from the forces that constrain us. So as I eat these beautiful, Spinach keftes de spinaca. 
these spinach fritters that Chef Jeff, the only thing we didn't see was that he put them in the hot oil three minutes on each side. Look how gorgeous those are. And you can squeeze a little bit of lemon. Highly recommended. Highly recommended. And we say our yehiratzon and we eat them. And we hope that we feel more freedom from the things that hold us back in the coming year. So with those blessings, these beautiful pumpkin and spinach, I wanna start wrapping up by offering a new year blessing. So I'm gonna share my screen one last time. I want to share with everyone the traditional greeting to say Shana Tova in Ladino. If you're not familiar, we say Añada Buena, Dulce y Alegre. You want to practice that? Añada Buena, Dulce y Alegre. And I want to teach a song that I wrote as a blessing, as an offering. I wrote this for um, my uh, penultimate album called Together and Juntos, which is a family, it's a holiday album. It goes through all the holidays of the Jewish calendar and it's a bilingual record in Ladino and in English. And this is my song for Rosh Hashanah. And you see the lyrics there. Um, what I'd love for you to join me on is the chorus, which is Añada Buena Dulce y Alegre wishing for a good year, may it be sweet and happy. Seas bendicho, seas contente. May you be blessed and may you be content. And I'm gonna start singing. And if the spirit moves you, I hope you'll sing along. May your year be sweet, como la miel, like the honey. May you hear the shofar que te desperté The chorus. Añada buena, dulce y alegre. Seas bendito, seas contente. May your vision be free. Come on a manzana, like the apple. May your soul find peace, be grande alegría. Añada buena, dulce y alegre. Seas bendito, seas contente. Start a new page and a libro de la vida. Añada buena, dulce y alegre. Seas bendito, seas contente. One more time. Añada buena, dulce y alegre. That is my wish for you. Thank you to everyone who has cooked with me, who has sung with me, who has listened to my stories. If you have questions, this is how to reach me. Again, if you want to learn about the Monastir project, it is at the very, very front of my webpage, of my website, which you see right there. If you have questions about the Monastir project, you can find a lot of information there. And I do hope that you will consider it in your end of year giving. And 
I just want to say thank you to everyone who has participated. And I can't end a program without singing one of the most iconic Sephardic songs. One that is filled with so much joy. And it is one of the most famous songs that is sung at every simcha, every holiday, every occasion. Avram Avinu, also known as Kwandal Arre Nimrod. And I'm not even gonna splash the lyrics because if hopefully you've printed out your lyrics, but um, if you don't have them in front of you, I hope that you will clap and sing along. And I hope that some of you might already even, even know it. It goes like this. And at the very least, you can clap with me. Cuando renimron al gambosalia, miraba en el cielo y en la estrella, vida una santa en la judería, que había de nacer Abraham Avino. Here we go. Abraham Avino, Padre querido, Padre bendito, luz de Israel. Abraham Avino, Padre querido, Padre Israel, la mujer de tierra que ido premiada, día en día ella preguntaba, ¿qué tenés la cara tan deliudada? Ella ya sabía el bien que tenía. Abraham vino, Padre querido, Padre bendito, luz de Israel. Abraham vino, Padre querido, Padre bendito, luz de Israel. Saludemos al compadre y también a Mohel, que por ser de judmos venga el goel, y regima a todo Israel. Ser solo haremos al verdadero. Abraham vino, Padre querido, Padre tan dicho, luz de Israel. Abraham vino, Padre querido, Padre tan dicho, luz de Israel. One more time. Abraham vino, Padre querido, Padre tan dicho, luz de Israel. Abraham vino, Padre querido, Padre Thank you so much, everybody. I will stay on for a few more minutes if anybody has additional questions. Otherwise, thank you again for joining me. Aniada buena, dulce y alegre. Please stay in touch. I hope to do more of these for other big holidays down the pike. And I hope you've enjoyed cooking and singing with me. And may you eat these in good health and with many blessings for the year to come. Thank you. Anyada buena.